All right, so yesterday we looked at, or not yesterday, Thursday, we looked at assigning stereochemistry um, to molecules, so uh, assigning them as either R or S stereocenters. And we practiced this challenging one above, but I've got another challenge for you. All right, let's consider this molecule. I'm just going to make it up. That should be a CL, not a 4. All right, so where is the highest priority substituent off of this stereo center? Let's pick it. Would it be fluorine, chlorine, oxygen, or carbon? Which one? Is fluorine heavier than chlorine? Chlorine is heavier, right? So chlorine would be priority one, followed by what? Followed by fluorine followed by oxygen, followed by carbon. So you might run into situations where you have a stereo center where your lowest priority isn't a hydrogen, right? It's perfectly normal. All right, so if we look at this, I'm running into a problem. Does anybody see the problem? So is the lowest priority a dash or a wedge? It's neither, right? So over here, problem I'm seeing is this lowest priority group is in plane. It's not a dash or a wedge. So how do we assign R or S? So let's come up with a simple trick for dealing with this. So let's first identify the problem. And so the solution that I'm going to show you is a bit different than the Klein textbook. My solution is to draw a Newman projection. Looking down the lowest priority. So what I mean by that is, let's imagine, I've got my little stick person here. The stick person is going to be looking straight through this lowest priority bond. Does that make sense? What we need to do is draw the front half only. All right, so now let's try this. So check to see if you can draw the front half of this Newman projection. How many of you think you got the front half of the Newman projection? Give me a thumbs up if you think you got it. Thumbs down if you don't know. Sideways thumb if you're just not sure. All right, it looks like majority thumbs up. All right, what's going to be sticking straight up? Fluorine. Then we got two legs. What would be over here to my bottom left? The OH which means that my chlorine must be here. All right, we already said that chlorine would be highest priority followed by fluorine, followed by oxygen. So now we can go counterclockwise or to the left. Is our lowest priority in front of us or behind us? It's behind us, so we're gonna stick with the normal rules this time, right? All right, so knowing that, would this be an R or an S stereo center? Yep. So left twist. plus lowest priority behind. Means that this must be an S stereo center. The Klein textbook has you do something different. If you find his approach better, you're welcome to use that. But I find that this actually works pretty well because we've just covered Newman projections a fair amount. And I think most people are pretty comfortable with that. All right, let's try another one. This is going to change things up a bit. This time I'm going to give you the name of a molecule and I want you to help me draw it. So in this molecule it's going to tell you position 1 is going to be an R, position 2 is going to be an S,
cyclohexane. All right. Now, a lot of people, when they see this, are going to say, well, how the heck do I know whether or not to draw a dash or a wedge off of position one and position two? Does anybody know a good strategy? Guess and check. So what I do is I just arbitrarily draw in a wedge, and then I check. If I draw in a wedge off of carbon one and it is, in fact, an R, then I know I'm correct, and I'll leave it as is. If I'm wrong, I just flip it to a dash, right? So easy enough. So let's have you practice this and see if you can guess and check your way to making the right molecule. All right, so I'm going to look for an honest show of hands. How many of you just feel lost with this process? All right, so let's do this together. That's okay. So we'll go ahead and draw our cyclohexane. And because I'm drawing it, I get to number it however I want. So I'm just going to number it like that, right? So off of carbon one, what do we have? A bromine. All right, so I'm just going to guess and check, and I'm going to say, all right, I'm going to draw this bromine as a wedge, because why not? 50-50 chance. We'll just leave it as is. All right, and then over here, I'm just going to leave my chloro as a line right now, and then we'll address that our next go around. All right, so let's think about it this way. This stereo center off of carbon one, what's the highest priority substituent? Would it be the bromine, the carbon on the left, or the carbon on the right? The bromine, right? All right, so now if we look over here, we've got a carbon-carbon tie. Which one's going to be a higher priority? On the right side. Why the one on the right? Because it has a chlorine as one of the next attached atoms. So we can go ahead and we can... Sometimes even avoid going through the full tiebreaker just by using intuition. And we could say one, two, three. Where's our lowest priority? Hydrogen. Where's the hydrogen going to be? In the back as a dash. So I'll go ahead and do that. If we look at this, it looks like it's twisting to the right or going clockwise. Is this an R or an S for number one? It's an R. So immediately up here, I'd say I guessed and checked, and I got lucky. I guessed right. Make sense? All right, so now that we've done that, I'm going to erase all of this, and I'm going to go over to my second carbon. All right, so let's just pick one. Do we want a dash or a wedge for a chlorine? Wedge? I'll do a dash. Why not? 50-50 <laughs> chance. Let's just roll the dice. Or flip the coin, I guess, is a better analogy there. All right. So let's go ahead. We'll say this is our stereo center we're looking at now. Highest priority. Must be the chlorine, right? That's the heaviest attached atom to that stereo center. All right, and then over here, we've got a carbon, carbon tie. Which one's going to be higher priority, the carbon on top or the carbon below? Carbon on top. Okay. So let's say one, two, three. And go ahead. So it looks like we're twisting to the left. However, where's our hydrogen? The hydrogen must be a wedge coming off of here. All right. So what should this stereo center be as drawn? It looks like an R stereo center. Up here, though, we said that it should be an S stereo center, not an R stereo center. Easy fix, though. What do we do? Yeah, change that chlorine to a wedge and the hydrogen to a dash. So we can go back up here. We can say, all right, this chlorine must be a wedge, and this hydrogen must be a dash, and voila, we've fixed our problem, so now that everything matches. Does that make sense? I know it's not the most elegant solution, but I've been teaching this for a while, and it's the best solution I've found. It's honestly what I do. I just guess and check. All right, my question for you is why not use a cis prefix? Anybody know? Okay, so cis could mean that both of the hydrogens are wedges. All right, so let's compare both of these. So we'll do the one we just drew up here where both of them were wedges and you're saying what if both the hydrogens 
we're going the opposite direction, meaning what if the bromine was a dash and the chlorine was a dash, right? Both of these would be qualified as cis. Are these the same or different? You think they're different? What if we flip them around and rotate them and spin them five times? Are they the same or different? They're completely different. If you made these two model kits and tried to overlay them atom for atom, there'd be no way you could. So these are actually different molecules. Oh, I can spell. Shh. You didn't see that. All right, so these are different molecules. Um, the way we avoid this is by using RNS. So oftentimes I prefer that students really use the R and S approach unless there's no other option available. Does that make sense? All right. So now we've got to think about what happens in an actual lab setting. So how can we determine if a molecule is chiral in lab? And it's actually a bit strange. Unfortunately, we don't have one of these instruments on campus. The way it works is you have a light source that goes through a polarizer. How many of you have polarized sunglasses at home? Polarized sunglasses work the same way, right? So if you think about light, the waves can either be going up and down or side to side. What this does is it only lets light through that's going in one direction instead of all directions, right? So in this case, once light goes through, we have polarized light that's only going in one direction that's kind of in this middle section right here. And then that polarized light actually gets um, put through your sample. So inside this tube right here is a one decimeter length of your liquid sample that's been dissolved in some sort of solvent. All right, chiral molecules will actually cause that polarized light to rotate slightly so that it starts spinning when it exits. When it exits, we can actually analyze the angle at which the polarized light has changed from its entrance. Does that make sense? It's a little bit strange to think about. So let's take a look at some examples here. All right. So let's say we've got this molecule. Is this molecule chiral? Yes, it definitely has a stereocenter. Would this be R or S? What would be the highest priority substituent coming off of this stereocenter? Bromine, followed by chlorine, followed by fluorine. So we can go through and say, all right, this must be an R stereocenter. And we could also say we know that it's chiral because if we were to draw the mirror image of this molecule, it would look like this, and the mirror image would not be superimposable, meaning if we were to make these two models, they would not be able to be overlaid atom for atom. And in fact, we could check this. We could say, all right, if we were to assign priorities to this, it would be one, two, three. What's this stereo center? S. So we can tell that the mirror image must have the opposite stereo center as well. All right, in lab, if I'm looking at this molecule, I can shine this through a polarimeter and it might rotate light 20 degrees in the positive direction. So that just means going clockwise. What do you think this molecule will do if we put it in? It'd be negative 20 degrees. So it's kind of interesting, right? So one-handed molecule will rotate light one direction. The other-handed molecule will rotate it exactly in the opposite direction, but at an equal magnitude. So let's make some notes here. The term for this is enantiomers.
They're mirror images of one another that rotate plane polarized light. at an equal magnitude but in opposite directions. So looking at the two samples that we have above, each of those are chiral, but the relationship to one another, because they're different, is they must be enantiomers. Enantiomers are a special type of isomerism, right? They're connected the same way, but they're arranged differently in their three-dimensional environment. So that's how we account for them. All right, let's do another note here. So my next question is, what happens if you have a 50-50 mix of both enantiomers? Does anybody have an idea for what might happen if we had an equal amount of the molecules Shown above, we dissolve them and then put them into a polarimeter. That's a good question. So I heard somebody say zero. I heard somebody say uh, they'll cancel out. Or sorry, I heard somebody say zero. I heard somebody say there'd be both a line at positive 20 and negative 20. The correct answer is they actually cancel out and average into zero. So the net effect of one molecule twisting light that direction and the other one twisting that direction, if you have an equal mixture, just means they cancel out in the end. So it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. There is no optical rotation. This is called a racemic mixture. Yeah, that's a good question. So let's say up above, I'm just going to make up numbers. You said 75 here and 25 this direction. Do you think it's going to cancel out anymore? No, we've got a lot more of the one on the right. Do you think it's going to rotate in the negative or positive direction overall? Negative. negative. Do you think it'll be as large as negative 20 though? No. So some will cancel out, but not all of it will cancel out. Yeah, that's a really good conceptual question though. The angle will be different or the same? Yeah, so the angle here, will it be negative 20 if we had a 75-25 mixture? Not quite. It'll be less than negative 20 because some of the sample will have canceled out. Yep. All right. So it is a little bit interesting, but racemic mixtures are kind of odd. All it means is that you have chiral molecules, but you've got an equal amount of both-handedness of that chiral molecule. Therefore, the net effect is zero when you put plain polarized light through it. All right, so we're not going to do a lot of math in this, but let's talk about optical rotation. All right, the symbols that are used is you usually have an alpha symbol and brackets, and the alpha symbol is the optical rotation. And then oftentimes up above, as your subscript, you have some sort of temperature. So in this case, 20 degrees Celsius. And then oftentimes you see a symbol down here. So let's kind of clarify what all of these are. So this is the temp in Celsius. This is your optical rotation. A 
under these conditions. And then the D one's kind of interesting. How many of you remember learning about spectral lines in general chemistry? I think a lot of you had the serial boxes where you went around looking at light sources. Those are spectral lines. The D stands for the D line from a sodium lamp. So that is the light that is used for a lot of these polarimeters because sodium lamps are incredibly cheap and easily accessible. All right. So alpha, if you remember, is what again? It's the optical rotation. That's the observed optical rotation. And then underneath we have concentration times path length. So let's kind of specify all of these again. C is concentration and grams per milliliters. I know it's frustrating that they don't use moles, but I didn't make up these rules, or molarity, I should say. And then the path length is in decimeters. I always tell my Chem 110 students, you almost never see the prefix deci used. At least I've never seen it used outside of the context of polarimetry. It's like the one weird niche area where you see deci used. What does deci mean? 10. So it just means it's a 10 centimeter path length, right? Um, so in this case, it's a pretty large sample. Over here, we said that the optical rotation is under the conditions of the concentration and path length. So the actual alpha in brackets has its own unique units that we have to be aware of. The units, if we think about it, are always going to be in degrees because that's the observed rotation on top over grams per milliliters times decimeters. Does that make sense? All right. So it is a bit weird. I'm not going to push the math very heavily. So I did want to get back to one point that Eric brought up. What happens if you have a mix of enantiomers that isn't a 50-50 mix. What was the answer to that again, getting back to the original question? Yeah, the products don't cancel, so there's no cancellation. Therefore, there must be an optical rotation, right? but the magnitude will be smaller. Oops. All right. We can actually calculate this using something called an antimeric excess. Finding the percent enantiomeric excess, also known as just percent EE. All right, so this calculation is a little bit weird to work with.
All right. So first thing we need to do is come up with the calculation for EE, and then we'll use that to find the ratio. All right, so on top, our numerator is the observed rotation for the mixture. And then on your denominator, this would be your observed rotation for your major and anterior, meaning your major component. times 100. So that can be used to tell us our percent EE. Now the question is how can we work with this to find our ratio? But before we do that, let's just use a simple sample uh, example calculation. So in our example, a chemist has a mix of enantiomers the wanted enantiomer has a optical rotation observed of positive 10 degrees the mix is positive 5 degrees. What's the EE percent for this example? You don't need to use your calculator. What would it be in this case? It would be 50%, right? So we would just say plus 5 degrees over positive 10 degrees times 100 equals 50% EE. All right, so let's think about what this means in a context of this problem. What I like to do is break it down. I do 100% minus my EE percent. Will tell me my leftover that is racemic. All right, so let's break this down even further using our example shown above. So I've got 100% minus 50%. That was the EE percent that we found up above, right? which means that we have 50% left over that is racemic. All right, what does racemic mean again? It means it's an even mixture, a 50-50 mixture, right? All right, so if we think about it this way, we can think about this as being the enantiomeric excess which means this has 50% extra. Excess by definition means extra above and beyond, right? However, if we think about the racemic mixture, was there any of our desired compound in that? So we know that this is our desired compound, but is there any of our desired compound in our racemic mixture? Half of it, right? So if we take this over, we could say half of racemic mix is still our desired enantiomer. So then we can say 50% plus one half of 50% is gonna be what? It's 
going to be 75% total, right? So if we look at this, that means that 75% of the mixture is the correct enantiomer. Does that make sense? Because oftentimes when people look at this, they see percent EE and they think, oh, 50% EE, that means 50% of my mixture is my correct enantiomer. Not quite. If it were 50% of your correct enantiomer, you would have no net optical rotation, right? Because then it would just be racemic. So we have to do some additional math above and beyond. The main question a lot of people ask me is, why does any of this matter, right? Why do we measure any of this stuff? Well, I want to go back to this slide. So you remember when we were talking about naproxen? Where I said we could have two different enantiomers of naproxen. We could have the R enantiomer and we could have the S enantiomer. We said one is an anti-inflammatory drug, the other one could kill you. If you're a drug company, do you want any of the other drug that could kill you in your mixture? Absolutely not. So what do you think they might do? They would get a sample from the pharmaceutical company. They would set up a polarimeter, make a mixture, shine polarized light through it, and they would check the percent EE. What percent EE do you think they want in a pharmaceutical drug? 100%, right? You don't want any of the incorrect enantiomer in there. 100% is ideal. Sometimes there's a little wiggle room, right? So maybe your body is okay with the incorrect molecule, so the will-kill-you drug. Maybe your body can handle a tiny, 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 tiny little fraction of that because the dose is so small it won't kill you or have any harmful byproducts with your metabolism. Um, so maybe it's like 99.9%. But polarimetry is often used to determine the purity of a drug. So trying to tell you, do you have almost all of your correct enantiomer? Is it 100%? What mixture is it in? Does that make more sense? In some drugs, it doesn't matter at all. So in this example we saw with ibuprofen, it sold as a 50-50 mixture of both enantiomers. What would the optical rotation be for this sample? Zero. So in this case, they don't want to spend the extra money and time trying to create one over the other if both of them work equally as well. Does that make sense? The other uh, one, oh shoot, I'm forgetting the drug name. Oh, what's the antacid drug that's really common? Is it Zyrtec? Zantac. Zantac is a really common drug. Zantac is usually sold kind of like ibuprofen as a 50-50 mixture. How many of you have heard of Nexium? So Nexium is actually a more potent form, and all Nexium is is they picked out the more effective handedness of that mixture, and then they sell it to you for like 10 times more. So that's all Nexium is. It's kind of interesting that way. All right, so now we're gonna switch into the, the super confusing part. And you're like, I thought this was confusing, stop. We're gonna talk about isomerism. All right, what does isomerism mean? Just in general, if I say isomer, what should go into your head? Same atom, same molecular formula, right? So an isomer in general has the same molecular formula. We were just talking about enantiomers, right? The left-handed version of a molecule versus the right-handed version. Are those isomers? Yeah, absolutely, right? Because they have the same molecular formula, but we know they're differently and they behave differently in the presence of plain polarized light. All right, but isomer is just the general term. So I'm going to make a flow chart here. All right, so isomer is just super duper generic, but it's not really helpful. All right, we can break this into two different classes. One we talked about during the first week, constitutional isomers. What's going on with the constitutional isomer? So they're the same molecular formula, but completely different connectivity, right? So we saw a few examples of those. Do enantiomers have different connectivity? What we were talking about just a second ago? 
No, they're just mirror images, right? So they look connected the same, but they're just different handedness. So constitutional isomers are different because they have different connectivity. This is different than stereoisomers. They have the same connectivity. But they have a different 3D layout. So we saw that as an example with enantiomers. All right? But stereoisomers can be broken down even further into two unique groups. All right? The one group we've already discussed is enantiomers. What's an easy way to describe enantiomers? Going back through our notes, how did we differentiate one enantiomer from the other? Well, we said they rotate plane polarized light differently. How were they related just drawing them? They were mirror images, right? So specifically, they were non-superimposable mirror images. All right, so let's take a look at a molecule down here. So I'll draw one in blue, and then I'll draw the mirror image of it in red. You see how these are mirror images of one another in space? Are they the same compound? Can we overlay them atom for atom? No. So this would be a good example of an enantiomer. All right. The next class are called diastereomers. These are not mirror images. but have the same connectivity. All right, so let's come up with a couple examples of diastereomers. A couple of these are pretty easy. So let's say I have this alkene versus this alkene. They're connected the same, right? The double bonds between carbon 2 and carbon 3. But are they mirror images? No. So these would be good examples of diastereomers. So we could say these are not mirror images. All right, let's try another one, though. This one's going to be a bit harder. All right, so on the left, I'll do this in blue. If we look at these two compounds, they're both 1,2 dimethyl cyclohexanes. Are they mirror images, though? No, not anymore. The main thing to remember is enantiomers are going to be mirror images. But not the same. Does that make sense? 